know, people ask all the time why change is so hard, and I think that change is so hard because we're so ingrained in doing things the way we've always done them, and that is our immediate default mechanism, particularly when things get tough. And I think, you know, kind of the art of change is the capacity to realize that change occurs in small little increments and realizing that uh, the change that we do has got to be better than the thing we had done before and to be comfortable with trying something different, doing something different and seeing what happens as a result and taking that as, a, as an approach to, to change because change is hard. And, but it's a, it's, a, it's a decision and a commitment to start and do and try and see what happens as a result can make the difficult scenario of change not as difficult. You know, some of the big uh, change drivers for healthcare systems, you know, the, there's a lot of them, the sort of the soil that good change can occur. Um, I think that, um, you know, leadership teams that can make a compelling case that connects with the people that are going to be doing the change and though CMS regulations and though value-based purchasing and though payer regulations are notable forces. They're not always an effective banner to mobilize people to transformative change. And great healthcare system leaders will use language, framing, and cueing that connects with people. Why we are here, why we're doing the work that we're doing, and why it really counts. Um, and I think that language will predict the success or not of a change effort. Um, I think effective leaders uh, that can predict favorable change are also those that will tap the talent and empower people to lead the change locally. Um, there is no bullhorn big enough in any healthcare system to mandate, regulate, and dictate what they do. Um, but to decide the general principles of what you want to achieve in terms of safety and clinical variation and adherence to evidence and patient-centeredness and allow uh, teams to be able to change where they are based upon their talent and their contribution and their commitment to the change and to let go of the reins a little bit and allow them uh, to innovate and create as opposed to mandate and dictate to. We find that when people um, have a chance to participate, the uptake of change is fundamentally different than when we mandate it and dictate it. So those are some of the key drivers for successful change in healthcare systems. You know, some of the key things that leaders can do to help engage others, um, first of all, is to recognize the people for the good work that they do. Um, I think an appreciation of who they are and what they do that represents a change effort um, can help make them feel valued and appreciated and also replicates and increases the likelihood of that very behavior occurring um, again. Um, I think another um, leader skill that enrolls others in change is to do the change yourself as a leader. It's really hard to ask people to do things that you're not doing yourself. And when people see um, you talking about the change, but they also see in the way that you carry yourself, you're doing the very things that you're asking of others. I think that's a behavior that helps facilitate that very change. Um, uh, I think, you know, a leader that's willing to defend the change, meaning having difficult conversations when you need to, if somebody breaches the things that you want to be able to do. So a leader that um, values and appreciates and recognizes others. I think a leader who leads the effort by example, and I think a leader that's willing to have an honest and respectful conversation when the change effort is breached. I think are key behaviors to helping to facilitate change. I think some of the most effective techniques for accelerating change is a willingness to take small bites and do small changes um, at a time. I think to begin to harvest the stories of what's happened as a result of those small incremental changes and the ability to tell stories in a public forum, uh, what happened as a result of doing things differently. And the end result is you can create a, a population of curious, interested, intrigued members of your system that think to themselves, hey, I can do that kind of thing too. 
and that can really accelerate change from occurring in just a small little bubble to begin to spread change like you would in a uh, like influenza spreads from one peer to another and then so on and so on and so on and in time leaders that become change agents by virtue of harvesting the stories and the impact of what's happened as a result telling the story of what happened as a result of doing things differently um, can really begin to accelerate uh, the awareness of the change effort and the change effort uh, itself and create I think a, a, a fun exciting dynamic rapidly changing always evolving continuously improving um, organization and and who doesn't want to be a part of that and I think that some of the behaviors that leaders can bring into the leadership space is really how we show up and what kind of worldview we project um, there's, there's a cast of characters that believe that we are victims of regulation, that CMS is out to get us, that there's no way we can get this done. We have failed this for so many reasons, so many times in the past. And if we show up with that banner, if we show up with that communication, if we show up with those cues, uh, that cue is immensely contagious and your team will begin to speak and carry themselves similarly. We call that a fixed mindset. We believe the world is stuck and we are victims of it and innovation, creativity, and hope and belief is nowhere to be found. The other cast of characters brings hope, belief, and optimism. Um, they bring and say things like imagine if. Uh, they bring um, um, optimism and a sense of inviting and gathering and mobilizing um, feedback. They use the feedback as a gift to continually get better. They see failure not as failure, but uh, failure as learning. And what can we learn from what happened so that doesn't happen again? And that growth mindset is a key attribute for leaders that can facilitate change. So as you look at the leaders around you, Look at the cues that they're giving you. Are they fixed? Are they growth? And you got to look at yourself. What kind of cues am I giving? Hope, belief, optimism, let's go, let's roll, let's do this, or CMS is out to get us again. Um, so think about that, because that'll predict whether you're able to mobilize others around that change effort. You know, one of the other key things in facilitating change is your ability as a leader to, to tap story to make the case for how things are right now um, and telling stories about what it might be like and what it can be like and the ability to access the limbic system of those that you're with um, which has the deepest hooks and the deep, deepest connections to behavioral change um, I think is a key part of a leader facilitating you know pretty transformative change and we can all think of a compelling story and how it impacted how we approach things. And as you try to build things like patient-centeredness, as you try to do things like reduce the variance of care, if you try to do things like um, mobilizing people around shared common ground purpose, our ability as leaders to tell stories is a key driver for our ability to mobilize people around that shared effort. So data's good, data's helpful, for why we do the work that we do, but the story of impact, the story of what it can be like, and the story of what happens when we do things better and differently or badly is a really important part of leader capacity to facilitate change. And don't ever forget that is one of our key parts of our tool chest for facilitating change. And frequently great leaders, particularly executive leaders, are just really good storytellers about the future, about the past, about the current state, and they use that to drive people to really commit to things that matter about why we're here and why we do the work that we do. So don't forget storytelling. So I know that we're all overwhelmed and besieged by metrics. And metrics are the currency of the world of what defines good healthcare. And metrics are important. It's the quantitative reflection of our mission, but you can't let the metric trump your mission. The metrics must be in service to the mission and must be subservient to the mission. It must be a quantitative reflection of your mission. 
And as we present to our physicians, as we present to our teams, mission first, why we were here, the story of what we want to be, uh, the common ground shared purpose of uh, the purpose of our assembly and the work that we do together must be the majority of our communication and not saying things like, we need to improve our HCAP scores, we need to improve our patient satisfaction scores. I'm not saying that those things are unimportant, but what I'm saying is by carrying those things forward and using that as your banner is the best way to disengage people from the behaviors necessary to actually achieve them. But if we speak about making impact in the lives of the patients that we serve here together as a team, and being the sort of clinicians we hope to be when we join this profession in the first place is a much better way to actually get people to commit to the very behaviors that will actually drive patients perception so make sure the mission first metrics second and never get those two confused or inverted